Step into the mic today, Chris Miles and TJ. We're joined by one of the junkies they call Lurch. And that's the, you know, I've never gotten a story on that, right? Why they call you Lurch. So where did that come from? Uh, first of all, hello, boys. Uh, <laughs> thanks for having me. Uh, you guys do a great job. Um, that started in college, Chris. Uh, my roommate, Frank, when I was at Salisbury State back in the early 90s, would call me Lurch because he was about five, six. And uh, I just looked like a giant to him. So he would just call me the Lurch. <laughs> Actually, all my roommates were pretty small um, at Salisbury. So they were all probably, you know, sub six footer. So they, they just, I don't know, it was just a stupid nickname. But but my original nickname, TJ, was Bish back in high school. Yeah. Uh, they didn't start calling me Lurch till college, but the original nickname was Bish. I'm, I'm trying to kind of revert back to that. I've been calling myself Bish on the show and trying to get away from Lurch. That's what I'm, that's what I'm more used to calling you, Bish, you know. Uh, and, uh, it's still taking me some time to get used to Lurch, but every now and then I'll slide it in there. Right. But you can just call me Jason, Chris. How about that? <laughs> yeah, that, that works for me, but I, I'm, I'm a little bit offended by one thing that, I, you know, I've always hooped and uh -huh. I've always been a point guard, right? right. Yeah. So when I'm with my hooping friends, I'm short as six feet even, right? When right. I'm not with my hooping friends, I get, oh, you're taller than I thought because people will see pictures and I'm always the midget in the pictures. So I am moderately offended because I'm sure some of your friends that were five, that you would say were five, six, were probably more like six, one. I mean, how tall are you exactly? Because I remember I the know. first time well, I saw you, you no, had like well, a said, brain in. I was like, I don't know how tall this guy is, but he's tall. Uh, I'm probably just shy of six, six. T six, nine. I'm just shy of six six. So, but no, six foot is not short to me. When I when I say short, I'm talking about five eight, five nine, but not six foot. No, you're you're legit. TJ, what's short to you? What's short to me? Under six foot. Yeah, under six foot. I'll give a six footer, six one. I give him. You know, when you're in a six foot class, when you when you creep over the six, you know, the six oh line, you're taller than the average cat. You know what I mean? So I'll give you a benefit of the doubt. TJ, I, I believe say. the average height is like 5'8". You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, if you're above average, you know, you're, you're a big dude. Everybody's short to me, though. Well, I'll tell you what. When we had – our high school team was like a college team in terms of the height because we had 6'9", 6'10", 6'11". We had a – I think we had a 7-footer. Wasn't Kalinowski a 7-footer? He's 6'11". Well, you know, okay. but for just college standards, round up, round up. Yeah, we just we had five or six guys who were at least six six. So when we rolled through, you know, uh, gyms or airports or whatever, they just thought we were a college team. Jason, have you ever thought about this? You know, as as good as our team was, thirty and three, lost three games, all of them out of town. Yep. You know, did not show up for the beach ball classic. Then mm -hmm. we got ran out of the gym down in pa uh, Patrick Henry and Rowan. George Hurt. Lynch, George, George Lynch, Lynch, Percy yeah. Covington. Um, Curtis Blair. Who I was Curtis Blair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Bernard that Basham. Was a good team, by the way, that was a legit team. Oh, they were they were strong. Bernard Basham played tight end at, at Virginia Tech. Yep. Um, you know, is it crazy to think that our team will probably never get into the Demantha Hall of Fame with only three losses? Uh, I don't even. How do you even get into the Demantha Hall of Fame? What do you have to do? <laughs> well, it seems like the standard is you have to, you know, no losses to one loss. If you have two losses, it's a, it's a far cry. We have three. And, three and, and we went undefeated in the conference. We didn't lose a conference game, WCAC. We won the uh, city title, beat Coolidge, yep. Donald Hodge. Yep. Then we went up to, uh, to Alhambra. Yep. Alhambra won that. Yep. Uh, look, we didn't show up in Myrtle Beach because we were just too worried about going to the beach and hanging out at the pools. <laughs> and, but, and let's face it, we did lose to Hillcrest with Everett Sullivan, played at Louisville. Yep. And then also uh, Joe Rett, and I think his Eric. first name was is Pew at All Claire. Eric Pew, yep. uh, point guard. You know, both of them went on and played really well in college. So the, you know, we didn't lose to any slouches. They were all ranked teams, and when we play yep. on a national schedule, but it's still crazy to think that we will probably never make it into throughout the Hall of Fame. You know what? I'm going to let you handle that. You got more pull over there than I do. <laughs> So, uh, by the way, uh, rest in peace, both obviously Coach Wooten, but uh, John Moreland, man. We just yes, lost indeed. our principal. Yes, indeed. You talk about the uh, Mount Rushmore, DeMatha. 
mm-hmm. add Buck Offit to that list, Morgan Wooten, John Moreland, and all very influential guys during our time, and for so many other DeMatha graduates. Yeah. I know you guys had uh, Coach Jones on. Um, I don't know when that was. Was that last week when you had Mike on? Yep. Was that early? Yeah. Um, and he obviously has been great there since Morgan left. But I'll tell you what, I'll match our team up with any of the teams he had because, okay, they might be athletic, but they don't have any size. And all we would do is dump the ball down to you and Gerard and Bobby Hill, and just those guys would be fouling out left and right. So <laughs> I'll, I'll take the 88 team against any team Mike had. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you take that charge uh, and uh, charge the hill with that. All I'm right, sure Vaughn Jones and Mike Jones might have something to do with that. Uh, I know. Yeah. But hey, the, the, the real, yeah, the real question is, who was the better Wooten, Joe or Brendan? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, well, no, we never played with Joe. So, I don't know. They were very similar, weren't they? Similar yeah. players. Obviously, Brendan was a little bit bigger, a little thicker. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but I don't know. That's a good question. But Joe did play on the undefeated team, didn't he? He did. Yeah, he did. And he never lets uh, get misses the opportunity to let me know. I got you. Yeah, we've had some good ones. Yeah. So, so, fish. You and Chris share a very similar passion because you get a chance to talk about DC sports here on a regular basis. Yeah. Uh, for you, it's probably ad nauseum. Uh, when you had to talk about the Washington football team as a uh, diehard 49ers fan. Right. Um, but give it, give us your thoughts right now about, you know, the D.C. sports teams. Let's start with the Washington football team since that's, you know, the most recent uh, team out there in their performance this year. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, they were very fortunate in that they were in the, one of the worst divisions ever. <laughs> and uh, every team had quarterback issues with, with Dak going down and uh, Daniel Jones in New York. He was, you know, he's a fumbling machine and then he got hurt. And then obviously Philadelphia Wentz just, uh, he, he regressed. And um, I, I don't know, it's, it was just a very weird year in the NFL with no fans and, and the COVID. And uh, anyway, so Alex Smith is not someone before the year started that, that Washington fans thought that they were going to have to count on, but they did. And then, um, and then Ron Rivera had to make that, that decision to, to cut Dwayne Haskins. A lot of that was his own doing with what he did off the, off the field. But, um, you know, people were excited just because they, they got into the playoffs, won a bad division. But now the real decision for Rivera and these new guys coming in, Marty Herney and Martin Mayhew, is what do they do at quarterback? Because Alex Smith's not the future. I know everyone was excited about Taylor Heineke. I'm sorry, Taylor Heineke's not the future. Um, you know, he could be a, a backup. But they've got to decide, all right, do we go out and make a trade for somebody? Are we in the Deshaun Watson sweepstakes? Um, you know, Matt Stafford, uh, Wentz, whoever. Or do we just have a bridge quarterback like Alex for one more year and then draft someone at 19 and then groom him for a year and then maybe he starts in two years? But that's the biggest decision for this team. You got to have a quarterback. And right now they don't have one that you're going to be able to rely on. I personally think Alex Smith is going to retire. I could be wrong. The guys I do the show with tell me I'm wrong, but we'll see. Um, but at 19, who are you going to draft? You're going to draft a, a Mac Jones. Are you going to draft a Kyle Trask? You're not going to get one of the, the top two or three. So um, that's just the big decision they have. Yeah. It, it seems like, almost like an obvious one to me then because if you look at this franchise and the quarterback situation and the NFC least and, you know, who can be dominant for years, I look at it as this team has the best opportunity they've had since the 80s and the 90s as far as their defense is concerned and the, the coach in there to kind of go get a quarterback and be the team in the NFC East for at least the next four or five or six years. Um I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy. I've been saying this for three weeks on overtime on 106.7 The Fan. Plug that, right? Um, <laughs> that, look, it's time. It's Now is the time to, to go all in. If you traded you know, your two first-round picks for RG3 that you didn't really miss and you had that one great year, everybody still talks about RG3's rookie year, and, and it's like this moment in history, and it's eight years later. All I'm saying is, let's say you go all in on Deshaun Watson. What's the worst thing that could happen? Three first-round picks, anybody but Chase Young and Terry McLaurin is where I'm at with it. And people are like, you sound crazy. I'm like, well, go look at those first-round picks. If you're, you know, 
Dwayne Haskins, Josh Doxson, and I don't know, whoever you want to say, Tim Settle, right? That's who you would be. I know he wasn't a first-round pick, but just thinking of having a player in there. Like, that's who you'd be giving up to get Deshaun Watson. Would you blink at that? Or or a Jonathan Allen or a Deron Payne, someone like that. You wouldn't think about that twice. I mean, yeah, there's Chase Young, but do you really think – do you really want to be picking second in a draft if you're going after Watson? It's kind of my my train of thought on it. So, where I'm at with it is all in on Deshaun Watson. I think this team – you know, this defense, people take it for granted, like, oh, it's going to be really good or, or great forever. No, this is the window. They're really good right now. You don't know how long they're going to play at this level or even higher. Go get a quarterback and try to win now. That's where I'm at. Do, do yeah. I sound crazy? Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit different there. I think as a Washington football team fan, I think we, we have too many holes to fill. So if you're going in all in on Deshaun Watson, although, you know, it would be a great get, do you have the 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 wherewithal under the cap to be able to get another wide receiver to to, to compliment McLaurin? Do you need you need draft him in the third round? That's you need, what you your best you need, receivers are drafted in the third round. You need two more. You know who's out there? You know this. Do we know what's out there as far as the third round draft pick wide receiver? You know, well, um, I mean, it's going to be. I'll, a deep draft. I'll disagree. I'll disagree with Chris and that the best receivers are third rounders. I mean, there's a lot of good ones in the first round. Just look at the guys who were drafted yeah. last year. But here, here's where I sit on this. Um, I wouldn't be willing to kind of just give up whatever it takes to get them because I think that the other teams that are going to be interested in them, they've got more to give and more ammo because they got a better draft slot. So let's just say the Jets really want them. Well, they draft two. They don't draft 19. All right, so you're going to have to really increase your offer to better the Jets' offer. And let's let's just say it's Miami. Well, they draft three. They don't draft 19. So that, that flip-flop right there in the first round immediately goes to the Jets or the Dolphins. You got 19 ain't sexy. So you got to give extra picks to, to try and get to Sean versus what the Jets and the Dolphins, possibly Atlanta, maybe Carolina, all those teams drafting ahead of you, right? So I would say... I certainly kick the tires on the trade, but man, you're going to have to give up a lot more than just three first rounders and a player. They're going, they're definitely going to one, one or one or two of those young bucks. You talk about Allen and Payne, sweat, maybe, you know, somebody they're going to ask for young, but we know we're not giving that one up, but they're going to ask for, you know, everything under the sun. Well, I don't think that's a, let me I don't think it's feasible. I mean, let me ask you this. What if they said, all right, we'll do the deal. You got to give us three ones and chase young. Would you trade him? No, 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 not for, not for Chase Young. That's where it stops for you is Chase Young. Chase Young or Terry McLaurin, because I think if you get rid of one of those two difference makers on your team, you're back, you're almost back to square one to me, at least. I look at it as this defense was, oh, there are a bunch of young guys who are underachieving. You throw Chase Young in, he wins defensive rookie of the year, he's a pro bowler, and all of a sudden, everyone on the defense is playing better. I, I'm not a football expert of the X's and O's and what a guy does, but I have two eyes and I've seen the difference in this football team. I know that he's a difference maker. And I think for the offense, Deshaun Watson would be that. I, and if it's not Deshaun Watson, they need a caliber player like that to get this offense going. I mean, they just, the, the Terry McLaurin is really, really good. Antonio Gibson, you lucked out with him. And beyond that, I don't even like, there's no, why are we, why would we talk about them? Beyond that, there's no need to talk about anyone else. Tell well, I know, but TJ's right. They got a lot of holes to fill. They got to add receivers. They got to add some linemen. They need two, at least two offensive linemen. They need another another tight end. Right. You know, they need another cornerback. You know, we don't know what the deal is with Landon. Hopefully he comes back. And, you know, we probably need a safety back there. You know, right. there's just too many holes to fill. So with a guy like Matt Stafford, does he have enough in the, in the tank to be able to get us – you know, like you said, a bridge a couple of years until we see what's either coming out of the draft or another, you know, that's a trade. Good question. I mean, he's an upgrade over what they have, but he's not yeah. a mobile guy. I mean, do you want to go? Because, you know, Rivera really likes those mobile quarterbacks. Yeah. That's why he went out and got Kyle Allen. That's why he signed Taylor Heineke and not someone else to replace Alex. So, I don't know. It's just it's going to be a big decision for them in the offseason to see what they do. I'm sure they're going to think about the Watson thing, but – I don't think they're going to be willing to give up the ammo that it's going to take to get them. Yeah. Right now, when you look at uh, the pause in the NBA schedule for the Washington Wizards, hmm. um, 
you talk about the land of misfit toys and uh, just really not having a whole lot of, uh, you know, workable parts to even contend for a playoff spot this year. Right. You know, <laughs> I, I've given you my, my thoughts about it. What are your thoughts about this Washington basketball team? Well, let's be honest, fellas. For years, defense has been optional, certainly under Scotty Brooks. It's optional. I don't know if they teach it. I don't know if they emphasize it. I don't know what they're doing in practice. I don't know if you just have guys who can't physically do it. Um, you know, I, I just, you got to be able to stop teams. I mean, you just look at all the, the 40 point games Bradley Beals had. What's, the, what's their record in his 40 point games? It's not very good. They've actually lost eight in a row, uh, which is tied for the NBA record. So think about that. You lose eight straight games where your top guy has 40 points. So, uh, yeah, they are what they are. I, I'm, I don't know how much rope Scotty Brooks has. I don't know what his contract situation is. I know he makes a buck, like five, six million a year, something in that range. But they just don't have guys who can consistently play defense. And I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how the Westbrook Beal thing is going to last over 70 games. It's, it's obviously not working right now because he's Beal scoring a bunch of points, but Westbrook's turned the ball over at a crazy rate and he's hurt. Now they got COVID. I mean, they're three and eight. So it doesn't look like it's going to work this year. They, and I don't know if Beal's going to want to stay here. What if he's, what if he pulls the heart and says, you know what? I'm done with it. I don't want to be here anymore. Make a deal. Get me out of here. Get me to LA or get me to Miami. I could see that happening too. It seems like it already has started down that road when he talked about in the press conference here lately about uh, them not playing defense, kind of calling out his team, uh, right ultimately calling out the coach for not having a defensive scheme. So that could be, uh, we might already be starting that steamroll. Put on your GM hat for a day for me, Lurch. If you, if this is your team, you're in charge of it, what do you do? Do you trade badly, Bill? Do you try to get ahead of things? Or what type of requisite parts do you have to, to be able to get entice somebody else to come in? Um, you know, at this point, I mean, why wouldn't you trade them? I mean, nothing's really worked. It didn't work with John and, and Bradley. Probably not going to work with Bradley and Russ. You want to get younger, get multiple players. You got to hope that these draft picks hit. I, I don't know, but you, you need stars to win. You, you need multiple stars to win rings. I know that winning a ring is so far beyond what they're, they can do right now based on their talent, but just making the playoffs every year, just being a consistent playoff team is, is a stretch for them. So would I trade Bradley Beal? I wouldn't want to. You know, I want a guy who I can who can score thirty a game. But if it's not working, why why keep him? But I'm not a GM. Never will be. I'd probably screw everything up. Um, comes down to just having the draft picks got to hit at some point. You know, they just do. Chris, what are your yeah. thoughts on that? No, I mean, I, I like the guy that they drafted this year in Denny Avdia. Uh, not a big fan of Rui Hachimura. I think they messed that up. I thought that should have been Brandon Clark, who also came out of Gonzaga and is in Memphis. Yep. Uh, I think he's more of an overall complete player, especially on the defensive end. Uh, we said that the night of the draft, um, and it's really become more and more apparent. I mean, Memphis loses Jaron Jackson Jr. and John Morant, and Brandon Clark led them to three, four straight wins out west. And now they've won, you know, five, six in a row and were able to hold it together without their best player, the reigning rookie of the year. So I, I think the Wizards need that kind of impact player, but it's also, like you said, coaching. I mean, I look at the line of demarcation. They had gone to the playoffs, what, four out of five straight years. Um, they let Randy Whitman go. And it seems like since then, there's been less accountability and less defense, you know, and, and okay. I look at Brad, you know, and this is not a knock on him. And if you can score 50 points in a game and the, the line is that you join Wilt Chamberlain and Michael Jordan and, and James Harden is the only players to score 50 points and lose three straight games. Like that's the category Bradley Beal is in now. I'm like, OK, I got to give you respect. But at the same point last year, he finished like dead last in the league on defensive efficiency. So if, right. you're, if your best player is spending that much time on the court and also towards the bottom of the league in clutch scoring, so a lot of those points aren't, you know, coming when they, they matter most. It's the opposite of, say, Devin Booker, who's scoring late in the fourth quarter most of his points. So, I mean, to me, there's so many problems that when I just lay those out, that's like the baseline, and then you can go from there 
as far as the other issues of who they pay, who they don't pay, who they trade, who they don't trade, that it really truly is um, sad to see how the state of affairs, because this was a perennial playoff team three years ago. I mean, they were doing it every single year, and it's like every move they've made since then has led to where we are now. Yeah, so I mean, I like Scotty, nice guy, comes on our show a lot, uh, but I, I just don't know if the future is too bright for Scotty, just based on how Bradley feels and just based on the numbers. You know, you, you got to have wins, you got to make the playoffs, and um, hell, they've even changed the rules where extra teams can possibly make the playoffs when they have those play in tournaments at the end of the year. So, I, I, it's just it's not going to be a good year if you're a Wizards fan. Now, we recently had an inauguration in D.C., which made me uh, find this little factoid about you that I need to, to get some uh, some background information here. Uh-huh. So apparently your mom has worked for a bunch of presidents. How many have you met? Like uh, how, what, what? Tell me that story. So my mother um, also, rest in peace, she passed away uh, in 19 from breast cancer in August of 19. But since the early 80s, um, she worked for um, – Reagan and both Bushes, Clinton, Obama, and then um, obviously briefly with Trump. And she retired in January of uh, 2017. Yeah, whenever his first full year was. Um, so yeah, so she she applied for this job back in the in the 80s. She saw the ad in the Washington Post, and it was for a court, kind of like a stenographer. So it's someone who listens to audio and types it out and her responsibility was to send whatever was coming out of the white house to the to the news to the to the media so she would obviously go into um, meetings with the presidents and whoever they were talking to record the conversations type it up and send it out to the media that was her job and she became director of the office the white house uh, sonographer's office and she did it for 35 almost 40 years. Um, so anyway, I, to answer your first question, how many, I've met them all. Now I didn't meet Trump because she wasn't there very long and she wasn't a big Trump fan. A lot of people weren't, mm-hmm. but um, I met all the other ones, White House Christmas parties. TJ and I met the Reagans back in 1988 after we won the city championship. My mother <laughs> got us into the White House for that um, that departure. Remember he was coming out of the White House and they were flying out on Marine One, Marine One, the Reagans. Yeah. Yep. Uh, my mother was good friends with uh, Marlon Fitzwater, who was the press secretary for Reagan, and um, really got really good guy. And my mom asked Marlon for a favor. Hey, my son just won the city championship. Would you mind if the Mathis basketball team came out and just met uh, the president and first lady as they left the White House to go on vacation? And he hooked it up. Uh, I still have pictures of that. You still have pictures, T? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They're all up. They're over Facebook. Big T kind of. Dwarfing uh, <laughs> the first lady, Mrs. Nancy Reagan. That was a that's a funny picture, man. Yeah. You got um, a bunch of six to nine, six ten guys standing yeah. around, little petite, frail uh, Nancy Reagan. Yeah, yeah. So I met them all, man, in in one way or the other, and uh, went to a lot of uh, White House Christmas parties, which were great. Uh, but yeah, she she's got some great stories, or had some great stories. Well, to you, who was the funniest that you ever met? Like, did did you ever get to see the president's personality? Um, no, just as much as you guys did, you know, I mean, Bush too was just, he he was just a clown. I mean, really funny. My my mother is a a hardcore liberal, hardcore liberal, but she really liked the Bushes. Um, just the personality, the way they treated their staffs and, um, she liked Obama, obviously she loved Obama and his staff. She liked Reagan, all of them. She just, she was out once Trump got elected. So she chose to, uh, she, she needed a knee replacement earlier in that 17, pretty sure it was 2017. And she kind of used that um, to, to bridge to retirement because she just, she wasn't going to work for Trump. Uh, but uh, I, I would say, that, I would say the Bushes were really good personalities. I didn't get to see much of Clinton. Um, I met him, but I didn't get to, I, I didn't talk to him ever. I, I talked to the other guys at, at White House Christmas party. Did you get a chance to uh, watch the inaugural ceremonies yesterday? And if you did, what were your thoughts about this uh, this transition into uh, Joe Biden and uh, Kamala Harris? I didn't watch too much of it. Um, I was kind of running around doing some stuff. But, um, yeah, it was kind of weird that 
you know, you know, there's no one there. There's no one on the mall. You know, you, you would have a few hundred thousand people, if not a million, especially for um, the first African-American to come in there, right? So I, I would think that would have been a huge deal, but hey, we're living in a screwed up world right now, bud, you know? No doubt about that, right? So this, uh, I, this I, I didn't true. watch as much. I didn't watch as much as a lot of people, but I, it just doesn't interest me like it used to, especially since my mom's not there anymore. Well, especially considering COVID, it's probably best that it was, you know, probably I'm sure they would have made taken some measures to kind of keep people spread out and make sure the masks are warm. But obviously, yeah. with the recent events of, uh, you know, January 6th, uh, we are, as you said, in a in a crazy mixed up world right now. I know. I hope it changes quickly. I have my doubts, but I hope it changes quickly. Yeah. So, Lurch, you're a, you're a, a man who loves to get out on the links on a fairly regular occasion. I'm sure that uh, when the warm weather, I think we're supposed to hit 50 today. So I don't know if you're contemplating uh, finding a golf course uh, if you don't already have it. Too, too cold. Too cold. So, uh, you know, you get a chance to, and I've heard, you know, listen to the show. You guys have been pretty critical of, of Tiger and, and his, uh -huh. his, his, uh, his personality. Yeah. Have you gotten a chance to see the uh, documentary and what are your thoughts about him, his career, his downfall, his comeback? I know. Well, I mean, I'm sure you guys watched it, right? I haven't seen it yet. Oh, you haven't? Okay. No. Um, it's, it's very well done. The way they put it together, um, it's very well done. They could have made that thing a 10-part series. They really could have. Um, but, you know, it was only about three and a half hours. So much has happened in that guy's life and his impact on the sport. Uh, but you really got to see in that documentary how he was um, kind of groomed to be great by his dad. Now, he was blessed because he just had the talent from when he was two years old. But um, his dad really did um, hammer home the fact that the kid was just bred to be the greatest golfer of all time and um, just hitting balls in his, in his driveway into a net in his garage into a net when he was two, three years old. But, um, and he was awesome. And then of course there was the reckoning because everything that happened after uh, 2007 or 08 with when he, you know, he, he ran into the tree and the, and the fire hydrant outside of his home because he was having the extramarital affair and his wife found out about it. So he did kind of hit rock bottom. You've all seen the video of him um, on the painkillers and on the Ambien when he gets pulled over. And he's in the, you know, he's in cuffs in the in the police station. Man, he hit rock bottom. But so for him to come back and win the Masters after that, it, it's just an incredible story, man. You, you can't make this stuff up. And um, the documentary really does a good job of kind of showing where he started, how he got so great, hitting the rock bottom, and then working his way back up to winning the Masters. Problem is with him is with his age and his back surgery, he's just had his fifth. He's probably not going to happen again. But um, for his for his uh, career to culminate with that 2019 Masters is an unbelievable story. How he treats people off the golf course, you know, I got my questions about that. But um, he certainly is a different person now because you know he's got kids and he's he would never um, really dap up opposing players and and hang out with opposing players and slap hands with kids as he's walking off the golf course. He would never do that in the mid 2000s, but he does it a lot now. So he's a different person. I think the kids probably changed him. Uh, but that, just to answer your first question, the documentary is unbelievable. You really should see it. Even if you're not a huge golf fan, you should see it. You would enjoy it. I definitely uh, plan on taking a look at it. I heard a lot of great things about it. Chris, you know, you know, again, you've covered sports, you know, probably, you know, across the gambit. And uh, I'm sure that as, a, you know, an African-American male taking a look at this phenom, Tiger, I don't know if you've got a chance to see the documentary, but what are your thoughts on this whole rise, fall, and rise again for Tiger Woods? Um, whew, That's pretty loaded in this sense. Um, I think we know the history of this country and what it takes for someone like Tiger Woods to be where he is. Um, and I'll say this, in the first time I encountered Tiger Woods, it was at a PGA Tour event where I was a very young broadcaster. Um, 
and I felt a racial component on the golf course, meaning I felt uncomfortable. I didn't know where to go. And it was one of, I felt way, I felt way more um, of a racial component than I did at a NASCAR event, you know? And it was one of those things where I was just trying to figure out and see how I could be comfortable and conduct my interviews. Well, I'll say this about Tiger Woods, as you mentioned in the mid two thousands, he was a robot. He was a mean spirited, like the way he carried himself was just foul. So to say that I saw a demise coming, I, I think I saw that. But at the same token, I could respect his focus and his intensity and just how great he was because I saw it firsthand. Meaning I saw, you know, thousands of people, and that's no exaggeration, follow his every footstep. And when he went to go swing a club, everyone shut up. To see that in person is one of the most insane things you've ever seen at a sporting event. Imagine Steph Curry at the free throw line, and it's probably more people than that. And he goes to the free throw line and everybody says, shh, and everybody shuts up, including any usher. No one moves. That's what it was like uh, seeing Tiger in his prime. And I've never seen anything like that with my own two eyes in, in person. But on the flip side of that, I think there was something lost in his humanity during that time period. And I'm interested in watching this documentary to see how maybe the fall of his golf game and his issues off the, the course has helped him to have a better life because that's what it sounds like to me. I think he's a better person, but he's also, like you said, he was, he was robotic um, in the kind of the way he handled himself with the short answers. He wouldn't give the media anything. Um, didn't really acknowledge the fans. Um, didn't have close relationships with, with other uh, tour pros. We're all different now. You know, has the fans, acknowledges the media, acknowledges the other players, has friends on tour. Um, but he, he was so focused on winning, 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 he hadn't lived, you know, and he, he, he hadn't lived off the golf course. And his father basically forced him to break up with his high school girlfriend who he loved. And who knows, may, may have married her, a girl named Dina Parr. Um, Is that the one with the letter? Yeah, he wrote a letter to her saying- Yeah, I've seen that letter. Yeah, my father and I have decided we can never see you again, right? <laughs> and this is only because he came home from college. He was at Stanford. He came home from college, lied to his parents, and said that he was coming home Friday, but he came home Thursday because he wanted to spend the night with his girlfriend, he wanted to see his girlfriend, right? Parents found out about it. They got so pissed, they basically forced him to break up with her. So that's the type of father he was dealing with. And it was golf, 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 win, win, win. Couldn't live off the golf course. Once his dad passed away, that's when he started to break out. And um, that, that you see that in the documentary. And there's, you know, obviously we've all heard about all the, the stories of all the, you know, the prostitutes and the strippers and the girls he met out in Vegas that he had had relationships with. But uh, it's, a, it's just really well put together. And I certainly, um, I enjoyed it. It was, it was really cool. Well, you say win, 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 and I think about your championship ring, man. You got from Ted Leonsis. Uh, what was, yeah, what was that moment like when you when you got that? Because here's the thing: I try to be kind to Ted. I realize the Wizards are a long way off from winning a championship, but every time I see him, I'm like, "Hey, Ted, how's it going? You know, hey, Zach, how's it going? Because if the Wizards ever win one, I'm trying to get one of them rings, man. So, uh, tell us about that and what was it like? Um. Well, that was unbelievable. Something we did not expect, that's for sure. Um, being in the parade was awesome, too. Um, but we didn't know what type of ring we were going to get because, you know, they give the players different types of rings than they do, you know, the PR staff. Right? But I think I'm going to show you boys these rings. It wasn't just the caps. It was the Nats, too. Oh, oh wow. So see that? Look at you with the hardware. Are those real diamonds? Oh, they're so real. Oh, man. <laughs> i put it this way. If I wanted to sell these two rings, I could probably put my daughter through one year at Virginia Tech. Oh, she's a hokey. Yeah, so that's how valuable these rings are. Now, I'm not going to sell them unless times get really hard. <laughs> but it was, it was incredible. <laughs> UVA. <laughs> hey, now, TJ, you know I covered them hokies for six years, and me and Beamer were friends, man. So hey, you know, Chris, I, I understand Tony your Bennett's all right. Tony Bennett's you, all right. Yeah, yeah, Tony Bennett's done pretty well. He's, uh, you know, and Bronco Mendenhall is on his way. He's doing the best he can, that's for sure. 
but you know, you know what they say about uh, folks that got into uh, Virginia Tech and and uh, you know Virginia Tech. So yeah. what do they say? I don't know. You tell me. Well, well, both those who applied to both UVA and Virginia Tech. Yeah. Well, the answer is both of us got into Virginia Tech. Uh, I see what you're saying, Ted, but, <laughs> you know, I, we're, we're in the sports business, all right? And we're talking – well, I guess you got a championship now for UVA. Tony Bennett has set you guys straight. We'll just say that. Well, yeah. when you, when you get some time – Did he give you a ring? He gave me a call. <laughs> <laughs> he gave me a ring, yeah. And I got this lovely trinket here from hey. the basketball staff. All basketball alumni I got a nice – What uh, is that, a 5T? Yeah, 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 yeah. Five X. They're not even okay. T. That's why it's hanging on this uh this That's hanger funny. right here. <laughs> oh man. So uh Bish, you got a you have a gambling podcast, is that correct? Uh well we did some I did something with a, a buddy of mine um a few months ago, but th that is that has kind of dried up and uh we're looking maybe to do something down the road, but I don't have a, a podcast currently, no. But I do gamble every day. <laughs> <laughs> so, so with the the big games this weekend, where you where you laying your uh, where you lay, laying your scratch on these uh, AFC and NFC championship games? Uh, you know what? I'm I'm looking at the numbers right now. Both are pretty even. Uh, I think they're both three point spreads right now, and the totals are well. The total in the NFC championship game is 51. Total in the AFC is about. 54. Um, let's let's see where we let's see what we get from Mahomes. I mean, Mahomes is going to play. Um, I know everyone's saying like the, the Chiefs didn't cover a lot this year. Well, that's because the Chiefs were given anywhere from seven to 19 points in most of their games. <laughs> the, the games that they were the games that they gave three or three and a half, um, they either pushed or covered. So they were given three and a half to the Ravens, beat them by 14. So I mean. I think the Chiefs is a good bet laying the three. Um, I'm kind of worried about Mahomes. I'm not worried about Mahomes in his neck or his head. I'm worried about that toe because he kind of injured that toe early in that game last week. And he was kind of gimping around. Um, but I just think the Chiefs are too good, too many weapons. They're probably going to get Hilaire and Watkins back for this game too. Kelsey, you can't cover him. They all, Hill, you can't cover him. They're going to find ways to get those guys open. So I, I like the Chiefs in that game. And then the Packers, Bucks. I mean, I don't, I don't know what my feel is on that game because the weather is going to be an issue. It's going to be cold, probably snowing. It's supposed to be windy. But Rodgers is used to that. Now, Brady's used to it, too, playing in New England for all those years. But I'm not sure about the rest of that roster. They don't practice in it. They don't play in it a lot. I'm not sure how that's going to affect the rest of the roster. So, um, you know, it's easy to say I like both home teams, but I think I do. I think I like Kansas City and Green Bay in those games. Uh, but the Green Bay Tampa game is kind of a toss up to me. I don't think anything could happen there. What about you All guys? Right. Well, yeah. I mean, it's too unpredictable for me. I just enjoy NFL games. I don't, I no longer bet on them. Uh, I bet on NBA games if I place a bet because, I mean, I know what's happening. <laughs> I know right. who's going to win, who's in, who's out. I mean, that's easy money for me. Go ahead, DJ. Yeah, from the optics, you know, I, I, I think I would have to go with the team that's. I think uh, Aaron Rodgers right now seems like there's a team of destiny that, you know, they have an advantage there. He's, you know, playing lights out. I would say Tom Brady has exceeded expectations considering he just joined this team. Um, but I think they're playing with house money right now. And I just think um, Kansas City just has too much going on in this game to even with Mahomes, you know, at 80 percent, even if it's the toe. I think he's just too gifted as a player uh, for them not to come through. Uh, and when the, and and pull this one off, so that's what I would I would say on this uh, on these games. I'll tell you what, Chris Miles, I'm gonna have to get your cell after this podcast is over because um, I'm I follow the NBA, but I cannot pick winners in the NBA. Um, like last night, the Nets, com their big three combined for 96 points, but they lose to Cleveland. Look, to you, you play basketball. Do you play three on five? They traded their big man. You were just talking about it. They uh -huh. traded. An all star caliber defending center and Ben's Jared Allen had Ben's KD work. trying to play center. I hate what they did. Forget about it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm just saying. So it's, I can't figure out the NBA. And um, so I'm going to have to get, get with you and you kind of give me some pointers on the NBA because 
for years I've been betting the NBA and I can't consistently win. I just can't predict when guys want to come to play, when teams want to come and show up. Like the Lakers losing to the Warriors and, and Curry didn't even play that well in the game. I'm out. I don't know what to do anymore. So. Oh, that was a that was a bad one because they were up 19 and yeah. were cruising. And really, that see, that's what happened. That's one of those where you would get so frustrated as a better because they had it. You had your line in. Everything was good. And look, Wiseman, Wiggins, and Ubre. These are three guys with something to prove. And they're like, we're not quitting yet. We're not quitting yet. And it yeah. threw AD and LeBron off. I mean, they were so thrown off by that game. It's it's the weirdest thing to see. Um, so speaking of putting your, your your money where your mouth is, you got your two rings on the line, right? Uh-huh. Two rings on the line. Which one of these Washington franchises wins the, the next ring first? Caps, Wizards, Washington football team, Nationals. Your two rings on the line uh, for that. Who are you gonna put? Who are you gonna put your rings on the line for? Well, obviously, I'm. Gonna, I, I got a. And that's a tough question. Wizards. Put your no, heart in. Wizards, no, no chance. Uh, <laughs> WFT, no chance because I don't know who their quarterback is. So I, I can't. I can't really put my money on them. Uh, Caps. I would obviously they won a couple years ago, but some of their stars are getting older. Um, so I'm going to say Nats just because Mike Rizzo is really good at his job. He's really good. He's been good forever. Uh, he was good in Arizona. He's good here. Um, but that's also a situation where, you know, some of their stars are getting older. I don't know how long Max is going to be here. Strasburg, you can't really count on him year to year. Uh, but I'm just going to say, I'll say Nats only because they did it and they proved it. And they got a guy running the ship that's, that's really good at his job and can put together a winning team. Um, now he's got to deal with an ownership group that doesn't necessarily want to give him the money to do it. Uh, but I, I would lean Nats, but Caps and Nats are probably pretty equal only because they've done it before. I don't give the Wizards any prayer. <laughs> no prayer, not unless they get a, another coach in there who's a defensive guy and they, somehow they, they – It would have to a, be an entire new roster. It would have to be. Or they, and they, they get lucky in the draft and they get a superstar in the draft and they can build around them, but I don't see it. Yeah. That's uh that's that's where I'm at with it. TJ, anything else? No, sir. It's been great having <laughs> you, my man. I appreciate you. My man T. I haven't seen you. You left it all up. We gotta get together and have some dinner or something, man. We spent too long. Sounds good. I, I'm not gonna meet you on a golf course because that'd be a waste of my time and yours. Uh, just <laughs> don't worry, I wasn't gonna ask you. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Chris, hey, let's, let's keep in touch, bro. And uh, congrats to you and your, your career. You're doing a great job. And, um, you know, I've heard you on uh, overnight. You do an awesome job there. I tell you, you, I couldn't do what you do. I don't think I could host a show by myself. Oh, you mean on TV or on the radio? On the radio? On, on the radio, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, it, it, it was hard the first time around, man. I call it getting in. Uh, it's like being a marathon runner. That's what it yeah. is. Yeah. I mean, I, I just, I'm not that, that quick witted. Um, I just need something to bounce ideas and opinions and thoughts off of. I, I couldn't do it by myself. So uh, good job. You're doing a great job. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, thanks for stepping to the mic today. Lurch, Bish, whatever you guys want to call him. He's got many nicknames, but of course it's Jason Bishop. Let people know your actual name from the junkies. Catch him on 1067 a fan every morning. If you're up super early, if you got kids like the rest of us at like 6 a.m. Make sure you listen. <laughs> you got it. Anytime, I, call, I, call, I call him my friend. Out of all the names, I call him my boy. Boy. Thanks a lot, Bish. Appreciate you, man. Anytime. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.